But first of all, in this lecture this morning, we're going to look at the acid-alkaline balance. What is the acid-alkaline balance? The acid-alkaline balance is on the pH scale. What does pH mean? pH means potential hydrogen. Because when you dissolve acid in a solution, it gives off hydrogen ions. So when you test how acid a solution is, you're actually testing how many hydrogen ions are in the solution. So let's have a look at this acid-alkaline scale because every body fluid has a reading on the pH scale. Up this end is the acid and the reading is naught. And up the other end we've got alkaline and the reading is 14. And in the middle we've got neutral. Neutral has a reading of 7. Most water should be neutral. Neither acid nor alkaline. Blood has a reading on the pH scale. The reading of blood is between 7.35 and 7.4. All blood is within that scale because if blood pH goes up to 8, the person will go into a coma and die of alkalosis. If blood pH drops down to 7.22, the person will go into a coma and die of acidosis. So as you can see, there cannot be much variation there. Now I've said this a few times this week, that the body is continually working to keep you alive. You were designed to heal. We don't have to worry about the pH of our blood because it is within that scale. There are two organs in your body that are constantly working to keep it in within that range. One is your lungs. Did you notice this morning when you started climbing a hill that you started to breathe deeply? The reason you start to breathe deeply is because your muscles are burning up a lot more oxygen and they need more oxygen, thus breathing deeply to get more. But one other thing's happening. As the oxygen's being burnt in the little energy cycles in the cell, the gaseous waste is being given off carbon dioxide and as carbon dioxide builds up in the blood, it creates an acid condition. So the breathing deeply gets more oxygen to alkalize, more carbon dioxide out to keep that balance. In fact, we don't choose to breathe deeply going up a hill, do we? <laughs> it just happens whether we like it or not. So your lungs help to keep the acid alkaline in the blood at the right level. The other organ is your kidneys. And your kidneys balance the acid alkaline in your blood in quite a fascinating way. Let me show you. This is the little Bowman's capsule. We drew it the other day, the little filtering unit. And there are one million in each kidney. These are the tubules where the waste is taken away. There's the filtering units. So the blood goes in. The blood weaves around the filtering units and comes out and it weaves around the tubules. 1800 litres of filtrate is filtered out of that little Bowman's capsule in a 24 hour period. That's out of your 2 million little filtering units. 1600 is reabsorbed approximately because approximately 1.5 litres is urinated out. So it's in this reabsorption section of the kidney where the tubules weave around is where the pH is balanced. If the pH of the blood is getting too acid, it is here that extra acid is dropped into the tubules to be urinated out. But if the pH of the blood is going too alkaline, then the blood will pull extra acid out of the out of the tubules and back into the blood and in that way the kidneys are constantly monitoring the pH of the blood. So you don't have to worry about the pH of your blood. It is in this reabsorption section where pH is balanced. It's in the reabsorption section of the kidneys that blood pressure is balanced. That water and salt is balanced in the body. So the kidneys are an amazing organ. They're not only filtering the blood, but they have a lot to do with what's called hemiostosis, or keeping the precision balance in the body fluids. So we don't have to worry, as I mentioned previously, about the pH of our blood, because these two organs are constantly balancing the pH of the blood. The pH of the blood cannot change, as you can see, but the pH of the cell can change. The pH of the cell 
should be approximately 6.5. That's very slightly acid. Why is that? The most acidic substance you can get is sulfuric acid. On the scale of speed, sulfuric acid travels at the speed of light. The most alkaline mineral that you can get is calcium. And on the scale of speed, calcium does not even move. The hydroponic gardener, he's constantly testing the pH of the water that his plants grow in. Because if the pH of the water goes too acid, the roots burn. If the pH of the water goes too alkaline, then the farmer doesn't get the speed of uptake of minerals out of the water and into the plant. You see, it's dependent on speed. The, the gardener is always testing his soil and he aims for a pH of 6.4. We looked on Monday. We come from dust, we go back to dust. We're dust. It's interesting that the pH of the cell and the soil are very similar. Slightly acid, so you get the speed of uptake of the minerals. Here is the cell. Sorry, here's the cell. And this is the little energy cycle in the cell. And the glucose goes in and there are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, approximately chemical reactions before the energy comes out. If the pH of the cell goes too acid, those chemical reactions are too fast. If the pH of the cell goes too alkaline, the little chemical reactions are too slow. So you see the precision balance of the pH is very important because those chemical reactions are happening by the millions as we sit and stand here. Coca-Cola, where does it stand? 2.6, way down here. It's a killer. Now let me give you an illustration here of how this can affect the body. I don't know about you, but some of my family, some of my friends are breaking every law every day. They're not breathing fresh air. Maybe they've got some old pillows. Maybe one guy I said, I'm trying to find out why I see this fungus in your blood, this, this big yeast presence. And I was going through everything and I couldn't, he'd not had antibiotics recently. He, I couldn't find out where. And I said, what about your bedroom? He said, oh, my bedroom. He said, often there's black mold on the ceiling. Ugh. What's this man breathing in all night? He's not getting any pure air in that bedroom. Be very careful you don't have a lot of mulch breaking down outside your bedroom window because that breakdown can cause it to come in the window where you're breathing all night. So pure air. If someone's not getting pure air, it can create an acid condition. Sunshine. A lot of people aren't getting enough sunshine. Not many people today are getting too much. Temperance, all the no list bring about an acid condition, as we'll see in a minute. Too much sleep, not enough sleep create an acid condition. Aerobic exercise, four hours a day, that would create a lot of lactic acid creating an acid condition, but most people don't exercise enough. And so lactic acid's building up, creating an acid condition. This is a lovely illustration. I had a guest here, she was 14, beautiful artist, and she drew my pictures. She drew a nice illustration of your very alkaline forming foods and we're going to have a look at that in a minute. Acid forming foods create an acid condition. Water alkalizes. I haven't met anyone that drinks too much water. Yet to meet that person. Dr. Christopher in America he said here's a sign to see if you're drinking too much water. You put your head on the side and if the water comes out your ears. <laughs> in other words it's virtually impossible to drink too much water. There is a story of a girl who was in the newspaper that died from drinking too much water. She was actually doing an experiment with some others. They were going to see how much they could drink without urinating. She got up to 35 litres. So don't drink 35 litres of water without urinating, okay? In other words, it has to be e extreme. Water alkalizes. Stress, worry. Anxiety, tension, distress. Patrick mentioned the, the other day, difference between stress and distress. Absolutely. I said to a guy one day, do you have much stress in your life? He said, yeah, and I love it. Work really well with it. And I thought, hmm, I must define this a little bit better. <laughs> he got to the point where he got all his staff. He said, if you guys can finish this by lunch, you're home. 
And he said, half a day his staff are doing more than they used to do in a full day. <laughs> a little bit of stress on them to get it done. There's nothing wrong with stress. It's right. It is distress. Creates an acid condition. Some of my fam family and friends are breaking every law every day. Lungs and kidneys are battling <laughs> to try and keep the pH of the blood going well as it should be. And then, oh no, can of Coke goes in. Or a cup of coffee with three teaspoons of sugar, fairly equal. Lungs and kidneys were already being challenged. The scales are tipped. Blood pH starts to drop, 7.35, 7.34. Alarm bells go off. The last resort buffer system is called on. Calcium phosphate is pulled out of the bones. Into the blood, in a form it should not really be in the blood, but it's a crisis. We're trying to save the life. Blood pH immediately starts to balance, 7.34, 7.35. We're safe but at a cost. We now have this calcium phosphate floating through the blood in a crystal form. What's the body going to do with it? Ah, it'll settle on the bone as bone spurs. If you say to the doctor, what's this bone spur? Where's it from? He'll say it's a calcium deposit, which is right. What's the next question? Why has the body put it on my bone and not in my bone? And because doctors don't study nutrition, a lot of them are unaware that it's because of what I was just telling you. Some of my friends are doctors and they know a lot about nutrition, but they've done their own research. A friend of mine told me recently, she said, you know, they're starting to put a little bit more nutrition into the doctor's seven-year med course. I said, great, because they take the Hippocratical Oath, but you know what Hippocrates said? Let food be your medicine and medicine be your food. I think a lot are being challenged because the medication's not doing it, as we all know. What else happens? Bone spurs get built up. And you all now know how to get rid of a bone spur, don't you? Castor oil compresses. Little by little, it'll break it down. I've got some good news. It'll never break your bone down. You see, herbs are synergistic. They work with the needs of the human body. And a bone spur is an unnatural formation. It can settle in the joints as gout, as arthritis. It can settle in the kidneys, contributing to kidney stones, gallbladder, contributing, contributing to gallstones. It can contribute to build up on the arterial walls. It can contribute to glaucoma's cataracts. Now, if glaucoma's cataracts aren't too advanced, and even if they're advanced, this is worth a try, one drop of castor oil in each eye before the person goes to bed can actually break down those deposits. Worth a go, isn't it? got nothing to lose. will not hurt your eyes. Remember castor oil penetrates very deep and it cleanses and breaks up those unnatural formations. Won't happen overnight but little by little they certainly can. I think that what I have just told you is a very good illustration of Newton's third law of motion. To every action there is an equal and an opposite reaction. A the coke created a very acid condition. That's the action. The reaction from the body is to pull the calcium out to negate it, and then we've got the results of that. I read in an old book one day, and I'll share this sentence with you because I think it says it so well about Newton's third law of motion. This law never ceases to act as nature's equaliser, setting in motion compensatory forces to remedy every imbalance. Isn't that the true cause of disease? The body reacting to an action. It's the law of action and reaction. But what affects the pH probably more than anything else is the food that we eat. Let's have a look at the effect of the food that we eat. I'm going to make a list of alkaline forming foods and I'm going to make a list of al acid forming foods. The most al alkaline forming food is the lemon. And you might say, aha, uh -huh, lemon is acid. You're right, you test the lemon, it is acid. Acid where it should be, in the stomach where that should be acid. Because only in an acid environment can those enzymes work that break down your protein. But when the lemon is split into singular structures, 
absorbed into your little villi, gets into your blood, goes to the liver, and the liver sends that glucose from the lemon to the fuel to be burnt as fuel. Let's come. Let's follow that little molecule of glucose way down into the energy cycle in the cell where it is burnt. All matter, when it is burnt, leaves an ash. And the food we eat, when it is burnt, inside every cell in the body is no exception. The lemon leaves an alkaline ash. The food that I will write here will leave an acid ash. How so? It's to do with the mineral content of the food. So lemon is high in your alkaline minerals, which are calcium, magnesium, sodium, and potassium. So these foods, especially the ones that I'm writing first, I'm writing the most alkaline down to average alkaline, are very high in your alkaline forming minerals. The second is the dark green leafy vegetables. Dark green leafy vegetables are the highest form of the magnesium. When you see dark green veggies, you know what you immediately think in your mind? There's my magnesium. There's my magnesium. When I did my nutrition course, I was astonished at the amount of minerals that you'll find in your dark green leafy vegetables. Remember that vegetables are high in fiber, high in minerals, low in sugars. Your fruit is high in fiber, high in sugars, low in minerals. And that's why when you break your fast yesterday, you broke your fast on a vegetable meal. Because we needed to bring in the real alkalines for the first meal. Dark green leafy vegetables. Aussies are getting better, aren't they? About 15 years ago, when I was a single mother, I was growing a big crop of cos lettuce. I didn't realize it was going to get so big, but we're in this little original homestead on a big property and there was cow manure everywhere. So I used to pay my children, I don't know, $2 a big load of cow manure and I had heaps. So I dig a hole in the garden, put the cow manure in, dig the next hole and put it on top of that and then I'd put a little cos lettuce seedling in. Well, the cos lettuce got very big, they were about this round, and when I pulled them out of the ground, their root system had totally encased this lump of cow manure. Now these were great cows, they weren't fed any rubbish, and this is one of the problems with some manures today, is what the chooks are being fed or the cows are being fed. So I went to the local fruit and veggie shop, I knew him, and I said, Andrew, I've got all these cos lettuce, you know, I'll just give them to you, you know, I just don't want to see them wasted. He said, thanks a lot, I'll try. But he said, I don't think anyone will buy them. He put them out the front of the shop at something like 80 cents a lettuce. People would walk past them, buy their cos lettuce, where the lettuce leaves were looking a little sad and they just wanted their white little centres. Jamie Oliver's done a lot for Australian cooking, hasn't he? Because <laughs> Aussies will buy cos lettuces today. And I love the cos because nearly every leaf has that dark green. And that's what you're looking for. How many Aussies throw away the good bits <laughs> and eat that white heart? I don't think so much now. At least Aussies are eating cos lettuce and even salad mix. But buy your organic salad mix because, you know, the salad mix that's not organic, they do soak it in some chemicals. It's a bit scary, isn't it? So your dark green leafy vegetables. Every day we should eat some form of dark green leafy vegetable. If you don't, you'll have to take a couple of doses of green barley. <laughs> One man came here and he was about 65 and he would not eat lettuce. And he heard this lecture and on Thursday lunch... He started with lettuce, because <laughs> I think you'll agree with me, we serve beautiful dressings, mm -hmm. yeah? and if someone thinks the, less it is, the salad is too bland, put the dressing on, you get beautiful dressings. My daughter works in an Italian restaurant, and when she was working in the little cafe part a few years ago, she said her, her boss's mother-in-law would bring in buckets of green leafy every morning. Wonderful way to increase your green leafy, Italian parsley, curly leaf parsley, oregano, basil. It's autumn now, and it felt like autumn this morning, didn't it? Mm -hmm. We're early March now. 
This is the time to put your rocket and your coriander seedlings in. They're your winter greens. Don't put your basil in now, the frost will kill it. We're still eating basil. We've got a beautiful basil, basil plant that we've been using to make the pestos that we had yesterday. What a nice way to eat dark green leafy vegetables as pesto, eh? And one day we didn't have any of the any of the the herbs and I was in the shop and I bought what I thought was coriander and it was uh, Italian parsley. Well, we just made the pesto on that, put a little bit of dried basil in and that was, was just as nice. I haven't met anyone who doesn't like the pesto. And you see, yesterday we served pesto with the cannelloni beans. That makes a yummy packed lunch. And there's boosting your protein levels by putting it with the beans. All vegetables have an alkaline effect. For some people though there is an exception and this is the nightshade group of vegetables so we'll put them under the question mark. For some people the nightshade group of vegetables have an acid effect. So that's your tomatoes, that's your capsicum, eggplant and the fourth vegetable in this family is potato. And I'm not referring to the sweet potato, which actually is not a potato, it's a yam. I'm referring to what the Fijians call the white man's potato or the Irish potato. All of these vegetables are part of the nightshade family. And it appears that if someone has an inflammatory condition in their body and they eat the nightshades, it increases the inflammation. Dr. Norman Chilvers, he wrote a book called The Chilvers Diet and the whole book's basically on the nightshades. And he shows how eliminating the nightshades when someone has, say, arthritis can help to heal from arthritis. We had a couple come here a few weeks ago, well, it was probably a couple of months ago now, and they were from Adelaide. And they just, they were in their late 60s, they both were had arthritis, both aches and pains were coming, they booked themselves into aged care and a friend gave them my DVDs and they heard about the nightshades, the lifestyle, so they thought what have we got to, to lose? The lady stopped the nightshades, they started exercising, drinking more water, having a light evening meal, stopped the coffees and the teas, both lost 10 kilos the lady said all her arthritic pains went and the joints started to go down. They got a new lease on life. They said, what are we doing in this old folks home? <laughs> so they got in their car and decided to have a bit of a holiday. And halfway around their holiday, they stopped in here and did a week here. <laughs> and this lady, you could not take the smile off her face. She said, I'm so excited. I thought my life was going into the latter, slower years of life. She said, I feel better now than I even felt in my 50s. You see, there is a formula, and if you abide by the formula, you will get the results. She said, do you think I could start eating some of the nightshades? I'm not sure, I said. Who will tell her? Her body will tell her. Absolutely right. One lady conquered her arthritis, started eating this, and in one week it was all back. I said, well, maybe the body's saying... A half a tomato three times a week. <laughs> Maybe the body's... You, you see this? No one can tell you what your body can tell you. When my mother was 51, she died a cripple in a wheelchair with rheumatoid arthritis. So I know I have some strong inherited tendencies there. But remember, genetics loads the gun, but it is lifestyle that pulls the trigger. My body says to me, I can have a little organic tomato. I've never been able to eat it in the last six months. I can. Have you ever heard of someone getting healthier as they get older? <laughs> it's possible. Capsicum, my body says, don't even think about it. How does my body tell me that? It repeats on me all afternoon and I actually feel a little ill. One lady said, I can eat red capsicum but not green. I love to hear stories about what people's bodies are telling them. How many people eat it and then throw down the myelant or the antacids? Doesn't make any sense, does it? But I'm not criticising. Many people do that through ignorance. They know no better. Eggplant. Myself, I might eat a little eggplant once a week. Potato. I have a little potato most days. My husband has about five times the potatoes that I have. <laughs> He's obviously not got a problem with the nightshade. So can you see this is for you to play with. This is something you play with. The fine tuning is yours. 
One lady said, but I love that food. I said, how much do you love your arthritis? That's not forever, as this lady discovered. Something happens when you cook tomatoes. When you cook tomatoes with olive oil, and I think you'll agree with me, it's the nicest oil to go with a tomato. When you cook tomato with olive oil, something's released that is not available in the raw tomato. It is a potent antioxidant called lycopene. Raw tomato will deliver what cooked tomato won't, and cooked tomato will deliver what raw tomato won't. I don't believe in an all raw diet, and I don't believe in an all cooked diet. I think we should be having half half. A lady rang me recently and she said, Barbara, I've got terrible irritable bowel. I had it 10 years ago, but I have been managing it. She's about mid 40s. I said, tell me what you're eating. She said, I'm having a big fruit salad for breakfast and the seeds. I said, I think you should stop the raw. She said, stop the raw? I said, just think of this. You just think of the lining of your gastrointestinal tract. What is raw carrot like when it hits it compared to soft carrot hitting it? She said, I never thought of that. I said, and I said, what are you having for lunch? I'm having a huge salad. I said, stop the salad. Just have cooked vegetables for lunch. Anyway, she was a bit hesitant because she had it in her mind she must have raw. I said, raw is very important, but you're in a crisis and it's just for a period of time to settle down that stomach. I said, have slippery on before every meal and just have some gentle cooked food. She, she emailed me a week later. Wow! <laughs> she said, I'm totally over it. She said, I never, ever connected the raw food with the irritation. <coughs> now, I myself, I believe most people eat too much cooked food and not enough raw. <laughs> all raw is extreme, all cooked extreme. On an all raw diet, it's very difficult to get the protein that you need. So it should be a little bit of both. One cup of cooked legumes, say lentils, will deliver 15 grams of protein. One cup of lentil sprouts will deliver 6.9 grams of protein. Can you see sprouting it? Even though, you know, it's certainly very digestible, you actually bring it back to a plant. And you have to be very cautious with sprouts, especially in hot weather, they mould very easily. So if you do do the sprouts, they really should be kept in the fridge. So a little bit of cooked and a little bit of raw is very, very important. I myself aim for about 50-50. And I had a lady come here who was absolutely huge. She went on a raw diet for a week. It was very good for her. <laughs> but some people can't handle that much raw diet for a week. For someone who is a little underweight, they have to be very cautious of the all raw. Lady rang me from New Zealand. She's got breast cancer. She's conquering breast cancer. And she's been managing it very well for about six years now. She's very tall and very slim. And she's in her, she'll be in her 70s now. She said, Barbara, I've been reading up on raw diet. I think I'm going to give it a go. And I said, be very cautious because you are, you are just, just right on the weight anymore and she would be underweight. I said, it's possible that you'll lose weight and you'll lose energy and you won't be able to get your protein. She said, I hear what you're saying, but I've been reading more on it and it sounds fantastic. You know when you can read a spill and you think this is it? She emailed me a month later. She said, I've lost a lot of weight. She said, I've just got no energy. So we had to come in quickly with protein powders <laughs> every meal and try and build her up again. Whereas the lady who was about 120 kilos, she went very well on the oral diet for a period of time. So sometimes you'll do things to the body just for a period of time because of a certain condition. That's where you use it like medicine. So how do you know what you are? If you love this food, if it sits well with you, if you don't have arthritis, I'll say you get a tick. It's like the lady that said, I love that food. I said, how much do you love your arthritis? So not forever. My daughter Julia works in, or she manages basically an Italian restaurant. She's hoping and praying she doesn't have my genes because she eats and cooks and <laughs> this food all the time. Well, I was 30 when I gave birth to her and I was actually going pretty good by then. I'd stopped the marijuana, stopped the alcohol, stopped the tea, stopped the coffee. <laughs> Maybe I gave her a better gene pool. Isn't that interesting? 
It's what you do to your body before you give or before you conceive that has a lot to do with the gene pool that you give your children. She's, uh, how old is she now? She's 38 now and still enjoying this food, so maybe she can do it. Fruit. Fruit has a question mark. One lady said, fruit's good. I said, fruit's fantastic. But for some people, they need to go easy on the fruit. Let's say someone has a yeast presence in their body and they eat a lot of fruit. The sugar in the fruit will feed the yeast. And by consuming the sugar in the fruit, the yeast gives off acetic acid. It gives off lactic acid. It gives off uric acid. And it gives off alcohol. Creating the very condition that yeast fungus love to thrive in. That can bring the pH down to 5.5. And in a 5.5 environment in the cell, this is where fungus thrives. It's also where cancer thrives. This scale is logarithmic. So the drop of one point has quite a dramatic effect in the body. The drop of one point means 60% less oxygen available for the cell. Woo. Remember, cancer cannot thrive. Sorry, cancer cannot live in the presence of oxygen. Can you see the ramifications of the cell pH? How important it is. It's the precision balance that your body runs at and your body's constantly trying to get your cell pH at 6.5. And as we go through this, you will see how you can do it. So if someone has a yeast presence in the body, I would say reduce the fruit right down. Maybe even just to Granny Smith apples and grapefruit. I think everyone should go on an antifungal diet in winter because that's when the Granny Smith apples and the grapefruit are at their best. Would do everyone, to ha would do everyone well to have a midwinter uh, yeast cleanse in their body. Almonds. Almonds are called the king of all nuts and they deserve the title because they are the most alkaline nut. They are the nut that is the highest in protein. 26 grams of protein to a cup of almonds. I don't suggest you eat a cup of almonds. I was at a, a conference one day. It was an advanced medical symposium. About 150 do dentists, doctors, nutritionists. And I was sitting next to a nutritionist. And she just had lunch and she's eating this meat and she's trying to get it in. And I said, not enjoying it? She said, I hate it, but I have to eat it to get my protein. I said, really? Have you tried vegetarian? She said, I did. I was eating a cup of almonds a day and I got an allergy to them. I said, what about the legumes? <laughs> so in this advanced medical symposium, I'm writing down a program for this nutritionist of how she could do it on a vegetarian diet. So almonds are great, but don't overdo them. They are also very high in calcium. They're also very high in iron. On my website, barbhealth.com.au, you can download an article called What Shall I Feed My Baby? And in that article, it talks about four different milks you can give the baby if the baby can't take the breast milk. And one of them is almond milk. And I met a lady one day who gave her baby almond milk. The other nut is Brazil. Brazil nuts are grown in Brazil. And they're not sprayed in Brazil. When they come into Australia, they are sprayed. But I was reading an article by a man who loved his Brazils. He said, the good news is it's just a surface spray to kill off any bug that's on the nut and it dissipates. So Brazil nuts are fairly safe. How important are Brazil nuts? Brazil nuts are very high. In fact, about 10 times higher than any other food in selenium. Selenium is a very important mineral in the body and mercury has an affinity for selenium. So when people have mercury fillings in their mouth, they're, they're usually low in selenium. Selenium is used by the thyroid gland to convert iodine into thyroxine. So very important to have Brazil nuts every day. Only five Brazil nuts a day will give you all the selenium that you need for that day. So you can have someone 
who's suffering from thyroid problems because they're low in selenium because of the mercury fillings in their mouth or because they're eating tuna and salad every day because they've been told that that's a very healthy lunch. These are two nuts that I eat every single day. They're the two Brazil nuts. Sorry, they're the two alkaline nuts. Soy. Soy is an alkaline legume. Lentils. Did you enjoy the red lentils this morning? They're delicious, aren't they? I, give the, I could give them to my husband every morning. He loves red lentils and avocado on sourdough toast, his favourite breakfast. I myself like a little variety, so maybe I cook them for him three mornings a week. And they're very quick. They cook in about 10 minutes. So lentils and lima beans. Lima beans are a big white legume, very delicious legume is the lima bean. They cook up really nice and soft. What about grains? Millet. You tasted millet for breakfast. It's a delicious grain, isn't it? I think it's one of my favourites. It's a light, sweet grain. Millet is a little different to other grains. Instead of two cups of water to one cup of grain, you've got to do three cups of water to one cup of grain when you cook the millet. And always buy hulled millet. If you buy millet with its hull on, you can cook it for two weeks and it'll still be crunchy. <laughs> some people don't mind it, but if someone's got, um, got some colon problems, uh, they might irritate a little. Quinoa. This is a grain Aussies are just beginning to become familiar with. It's spelt quinoa, but it's pronounced quinoa. The Aztecs love their quinoa. Aussies are starting to get familiar with it because it's a gluten-free grain. So is millet. Buckwheat. It's interesting that your alkaline grains are all your gluten-free grains. The Russians and the Polish love their buckwheat. A lot of Aussies don't because it's a little bit strong, but a very nice way to get used to buckwheat is to buy buckwheat pancake mix from your health food shop. Makes a nice pancake. Spelt. One lady said to me, how do you spell spelt? <laughs> That's how you spell spelt. Some say it's spelt is what wheat used to be. I don't know. I cannot confirm that. I was talking to a Polish lady one day. She said, oh, we've been eating spelt for centuries. Spelt is very similar to wheat. Spelt does have gluten, but it is a less complex protein structure. Let me show you. This is the protein structure of wheat. Very complex protein structure. This is the, so there's wheat. You see the gluten part of the wheat is the protein part of the wheat. This is the gluten or the protein part of spelt. It is less complex. It's quite simple. And when you turn your spelt grain into a bread by the sourdough method, so making sourdough spelt bread, that breaks the protein com complex down even simpler. People with celiac often cannot handle spelt or even spelt sourdough bread, but people who are gluten sensitive or gluten intolerant, they can handle the spelt. And some cannot handle the spelt, but they can handle it as a sourdough. And that's why, because a sourdough bread contains microorganisms, wild yeast and lactobacillus acidophilus. It's the wild yeast that breaks down the protein structure in the grain. And it is the lactobacillus that consumes the waste from the breakdown from the yeast. So when you eat sourdough bread, you're actually eating pre-digested grain. It's a lot easier for the stomach to break down. Why are so many people gluten intolerant? I would say 75 to 80% of guests that come here are either sensitive to gluten, gluten intolerant, or the severe sign is celiac. Why is that? There are four reasons. One is babies are being fed starch too young. Strange things are happening today. People are feeding babies food and human beings, adults, are drinking milk. Isn't that strange? 
We don't think it is because it's so we're so used to it. It's only the last hundred years that babies are being fed food. Now, when I was a young mother, I didn't like the way mothering happened. I didn't like that you had to buy all these contraptions and all these special foods and formulas. So I decided that I would make island women and African women in villages my mentors. And I was going to mother like they did. I slept with my babies, I breastfed my babies, I carried my babies in slings until they could walk and I didn't feed them. And I didn't feed them because they didn't have teeth because that defied reason to me. I thought babies should not eat until they can sit, till they can get the food, until they have something in their mouth to chew it. Does that make sense? You know, there's been a death. No one attended the funeral because no one knew he died. It was the death of common sense. Isn't that right? We may not be doctors, but we have common sense. So that's what I did. My babies had lots of wet nappies. They were happy. They were well padded. I thought, they are not giving me any sign that they need any more. Some people want their babies to sleep through the night. Well, my baby slept through the night from about two and a half years. And I just slept with them. And if they woke, I just stuck them on. And people would say, give them something at night. They'll sleep through the night. Give them something at night. They're so knocked out from this food that they can't digest that they go. (sighs) It's scary, isn't it? The fact is that the first teeth are the four up the top and the four down the bottom. They're tearing teeth. And they come when a baby's between seven, nine, ten months of age. The next teeth are the molars. And the molars come through here and they, they appear between 14, maybe 20 months of age. Now those tylen, I mean those molars are grinders. And what do you grind? You grind the grain. So babies should not be having any grain till those molars are there. And science shows us that when those molars appear, something is started to be released in the mouth called tylen. Tylen is not released in the mouth until the molars are fully through. And it is tylen that breaks down starch. So when babies are given starch before their molars are there, they cannot break the starch down. I first heard about this when my daughter Emma was in hospital with whooping cough. She was admitted for six weeks whooping cough when she was only about six weeks of age. And I got to know this male nurse. By the way, my daughter was the worst case they'd ever seen. She got to spasming without coughing. She was preemie, so she was this tiny little thing. When she finally was dismissed from hospital, discharged, she was four months old and she was seven pound. They didn't expect her to live. And she was under immunisation age. So when my next child was born, I immunised him at two and a half months and then he got a terrible reaction. So one of my children got whooping cough, the other one got the reaction. What I know now, I don't advise immunisation at all because if the body's designed to heal itself, it doesn't need that. But in hospital, my baby got so sick, one day one of the male nurses came through and he saw her arm waving. And this surprised him because Emma just lay there. The only time she moved is if she was coughing. And he went up to her and she's bright blue and she's just spasming. And he immediately pushed the buzzer and gave her mouth to mouth and it saved her life. Now I got to know this male nurse quite well and he was in charge of the malabsorption syndrome ward in Camperdown Children's Hospital. He said that ward is full of babies who are fed starch before they've even got teeth. Starch before they've got the molars with the tylen. And he was very strong on it. Now Emma's 35, this is 35 years ago. So I got that message very young. He said, babies should not have starch till those molars are there. Now you read most baby feeding brochures. Who wrote them? Turn it over. Heinz baby food. What are they going to tell you? And then there was a message came out, breast milk doesn't have enough iron in it after six months of age. Only the first six months does breast milk have enough iron in it. So you've got to feed the baby food after six months of age. 
And so I read this article in an ABA, Australian Breastfeeding Association article, where they got all these babies and they gave them the exact amount of iron as a supplement that was in the breast milk at the first six months. They all got diarrhoea. You see, God didn't make a mistake, hey? <laughs> and that's the beauty of breast milk. Breast milk, when the baby's two weeks old, is perfectly designed for that baby's needs. Breast milk at six months, perfectly designed. Breast milk when the baby's two years old, perfectly designed. The breast milk changes as the baby grows. You can never get another milk to do that. So I didn't feed my baby's food. James, he's 34 today, built like this, you know, biceps like my thighs, master builder, smart guy, strong, healthy, fit, he did not eat any food till he was 16 months old. My daughter Emma, she did the same with her babies. She had twins running round, this, this tall, running round, little toddlers, and they'd never even tasted food. You'd never hear that, do you? She said, one's got the teeth, the other hasn't. I'm not going to give it to one until the other's got their teeth. <laughs> and it certainly didn't help hurt these little girls. Breast milk is perfect. And the baby should be the guide when the baby can sit, when the baby can feed itself, when the baby has a good set of teeth to be able to chew the food. Does that make sense? Makes total sense. What's happening is we're getting adults in their 30s, 40s, 50s developing gluten intolerance because of what they were fed as babies. So that's one of the reasons we're seeing so much gluten intolerance. Malabsorption syndrome is set up in the gut because this starch is coming down and it hasn't been broken down. Number two, Aussies overdo gluten. Let's have a look at how many of these foods have gluten. Most cereals, all breads, all cakes, all pizzas, all pies, all pastas. The majority of the food that Aussies eat is gluten. Let's have a look. Wheat bix and toast for breakfast, cake biscuit mid-morning, sandwiches or pies for lunch, cake biscuit mid-afternoon, pasta, pizza for tea. What's that? 100% gluten. It's just overdoing the gluten. Number three, most wheat in Australia today has been hybridised to produce more gluten. Why? Well, then the pasta doesn't fall apart. Then the bread doesn't crumble because gluten gives it its elasticity. So if you have a look at grain in its natural state compared to grain today, today's grain has sometimes three times the gluten as it had in its traditional state. And the fourth reason is most grain today, most wheat today is grown with superphosphates. We had a, a wheat farmer's wife here Oh, only about three months ago. And I was asking her, she said, yeah, they all grow it with superphosphate. We don't do it anymore, we just lease out our land, but they grow it with superphosphate. Superphosphate produces show ponies of vegetables, of grains, look good, but it doesn't have the minerals. Too much phosphorus, which is an acid-forming mineral. You see, when superphosphate's put in the soil, it, it kills all the microorganisms in the soil because it's so harsh. And it's the microorganisms in the soil that are responsible for pulling the minerals out of the soil and putting it into the plant. So when the human being eats that wheat, it doesn't have the essential minerals that are necessary to break down the gluten. So they're the four reasons why we're seeing so much gluten intolerance. So very important, if you know a mother, download the article on my website and just say, read this. <laughs> Um, yeah? What was that called again, that website? Barb, Barb Health. The website is Barb Health. www.barbhealth. B A R B H E A L T H. Barbhealth.com.au. All your seeds are alkaline. Down here we're getting to neutral, which is most of your oils, maple syrups, honeys. They're about neutral. The most acid forming substance you can put into your body is the pure crystallized acid that's extracted from the sugarcane plant. A green leafy food is sugarcane. It is not acid forming in its natural state. But you, when you extract that 
acid cause sugar out of it. Have a look at where coke is. Meat. Meat in its nature when it's broken down to food and taken into the energy cycles in your cell is very acid forming. Aged cheese. What's the blue in the blue vein cheese? The blue in the blue vein cheese is mold. So all your aged cheese, they have their flavour because of the yeast. Let me put a distinction here between aged cheeses and fresh cheeses. Fresh cheeses are a pH of approximately 7. So there's your feta. And you can get some very nice goat fetters now. When I went down to Tassie to visit my daughter, she gets this goat feta in a little glass jar with oil and herbs and it's very nice. I was at my daughter Julia's in Mildura at the restaurant there. She said, Mum, let me make you a goat cheese and tomato on crusty sourdough bread. I said, ah, goat's cheese. She said, this one's nice. She said, the goat farmers have discovered that Aussies don't like cheese, don't like cheese that tastes like old billy goats. <laughs> so you can get some nice mild ones now. And I think you were telling me, Belinda, about uh, a sheep's cheese. Yeah, you can get some nice sheep's cheeses too. So your feta, your ricottas your cottage, they are all fresh cheeses so they don't have the yeast components so they are in a pH of 7. The biggest concern of course about these cheeses is the, is the cows that they come from. But if your family wants to eat cheese, put some feta in the cheese drawer <laughs> and not your aged cheese. And this week we're showing you how you can make some quite nice cheese alternatives with nuts and seeds. On Saturday we have lasagna for lunch and there's a beautiful cheese type topping but it's actually made out of nuts and seeds and garlic and different things and when it cooks it sets. And caffeine. Oh by the way before we move on from cheese my daughter was in Italy traveling in Italy and she said mum they don't put cheese on pizza in Italy. Most Pizzas are really thin and crusty with lots of onion, fresh tomato, fresh herbs, olives. There are some types of pizza that they put a mozzarella on, but it's like a, a fresh light one, very much different to one we have in Australia. It's actually an American thing, putting all this cheese on top of pizza. Caffeine. All your caffeine foods and drinks have an acid effect in the body, as can be seen by where Coke sits. One of the dangers too with caffeine is that it not only has this acid effect but it leaches calcium and magnesium out of the body. So it can be responsible for magnesium and calcium depletion in the body. Alcohol is not a food but it creates an acid condition. Tobacco is not a food but it also creates an acid condition in the body. All other grains all other legumes and all other nuts create an acid condition. To maintain the cellular pH of 6.5 we need to be having 20 to 30 percent acid forming foods and 70 to 80 percent alkaline forming foods. That ratio will maintain the 6.5. And I'm sure you're not surprised to hear me say that that 20 to 30 percent should come from this little section here. But sadly, the sick vegetarians that I meet, have you met some sick vegetarians? I've met some very sick vegetarians and I find that they're eating here. And that is creating this high carbohydrate diet that has all the corresponding problems we've been talking about. The diabetes, the weight gain, high carbohydrate, high sugar feeding the cancer, overworking the pancreas, more cholesterol is made. What would most Aussies uh, ratio be? 90%, 10%? One of the easiest ways to shift the ratio is to increase the vegetables, increase the dark green leafy vegetables. That's an easy way to do it. 
You see, it's not that this section is bad. This section is very important to keep the balance because you don't want to go too alkaline either. It's all a matter of balance. The meals that we will be serving you will be an illustration of how you can do it. And the easiest way is just to increase your vegetables and your dark green vegetables. You can actually bring some of these grains over to here a little bit more by culturing them in the sourdough method. So when you eat sourdough spelt bread, well it's already some alkalizing but it'll shift it up to more alkaline. You can get sourdough wheat bread, sourdough rye bread, sourdough spelt bread. It's just the process by which the bread is made and rises. And traditionally in Europe that's the only way bread was ever made. The yeast bread that we get in Australia today, they've hybridised the yeast. They've extracted that yeast strain because they want it to rise in half an hour. It actually causes the grain to explode, whereas the sourdough process, it actually causes the grain to blossom like a flower. And it's much easier to digest. You can eat sourdough bread hot out of the oven, but you cannot eat yeast bread hot out of the oven. It's indigestible. So again, it's going back to the old ways, isn't it? <laughs> the old traditional tried and true ways. I'm going to give everyone a break now. Please have a five-minute break. And when you come back, we're going to look at fantastic fats. <laughs>